Good to be back here um, after a couple of years in this um, uh, event, which, is, uh, uh, yeah, which has such an influence, I think, for the area and for the region. I'm happy to bring uh, this week um, this porous city to you as um, a constructive and protest act, somehow. It is uh, done with uh, some of your students, as you've seen on the film, in order to, uh, to activate, say, a kind of campaign to, uh, to use our densities not only for massing, but also for openings as such. Massivity is um, an issue that um, is happening a lot in Southeast Asia. And since somehow our cities want to uh, span the gap between the demand and the scarcity of sources that, uh, that's happening in many of your places. But if I look carefully to your city set, this is Shenzhen, uh, some kind of streets when you just go around, and then this operation of density seems to happening with a kind of feeling that you want to do something different. It becomes incredibly boring. It's all of the same. It has simply one extrusion of one typology, housing or offices, and that's how you do it. It's understandable from a point of view to speed up as such and to have like rapidly um, um, your demands uh, coming up. But can we not I mean, activate this massivity to house more than only its own destination? If I look carefully to uh, that production uh, all around and I see what is happening and uh, then I get this kind of monsters everywhere, I don't know that they, I'm not sure if they're beautiful. They all have the same topology. You go into a door um, and go up and back again, and that's it. They don't seem to make contact with each other. They behave uh, like autists on, uh, on the planet. So what we try to do here in the workshop here is a kind of operation that we try to do at more places to investigate this simple act, that is Lego act. I mean, I know it's a simple material, but uh, uh, they help to open up the towers as such. Just tack, like that's it. But how to study that? Because that's doable, one could say, with one door doesn't make sense. So if you look uh, to some of the series that you can imagine, the opening act can lead to stairs, can lead to public and open spaces, like this, say, a pregnant woman. Um, there can be a splitting act of towers coming up that leads to more facades, to more addresses as such. It can lead to twisting elements that create gardens. It can lead to blocks that twist around to make, make neighborhoods or bumps that turn into uh, collective, say, enterprises. Every one of them, and like this cactus, this twisting aspect, they, they try to find out how many facades can I have, how many open and outside airs uh, uh, can I make, how many connectivity can I do, and therefore try to activate some kind of ecology, both in uh, natural as in social terms. Of course, the question at that moment is, if I go one step further, and I show, for instance, one series that you start from nothing, normal tower, and I add balconies, say outside spaces, at a certain moment these towers collapse because of uh, uh, the weight, because of the, uh, uh, the, the, the finance, etc. So the study wants to find out with every technology when that collapsing moment is appearing, again from nothing to the, the most hollow tower uh, imaginable, the ball series, is such an adventure to do that, or the cornflakes one, or the, the ones that deviate, or the ones that turn into a landscape, or that use parasites. Each of them wants to open it up in its own ways. And if we do that, then you get this kind of, say, sequential researchers behind each other, and how any tower, any suggestion, any way of dealing with this social or ecological aspect turns into an, an operation. And then we can start to make like, fields of towers that somehow comment this massivity, that somehow behave like an army of towers uh, and improving the, say, the Xi'an suggestion with this uh, kind of enterprise. Here you see this, uh, this, this belly that opens itself for collectiveness at that moment. Or here you see um, ones that behave like solo wit and that give space to our, uh, our societies back again or one that wants to hollow it up in interiorly, or this one that makes a kind of stair that goes all around from the bottom to the top and activating uh, our program. And of course, this one is one of the favorites, this bending tower. He's very polite to everybody, but actually he, you have like a continuous stair from the bottom to the top. And that's, uh, so th that's the operation. Here's some twisting elements, here are the cornflakes, here are the terraces, and there the whole army is, uh, say, appearing. 
And we want to add to this army a sequence of researchers, because what do we know at that moment, besides, say, the richness of this kind of adventure? Somehow we want to post-script it. Scripting is these days done as a kind of pre-scripting, and it blocks sometimes our fantasies. And if we can make it start with kind of intuition, fast analysis, and later post-scripted, then we can open up a combined intuitivity again with, uh, with the rationale. So this is the stairs, for instance, that I showed before, how it's scripted, how they lead from one connection point to the others, how it brings up from one floor to the others, the people, and then you have a tower like that, that, you can, that is shown on this spot. Wow, now I can understand how things can, say, stair scripting can be combined with, with scripting of the, uh, uh, say, the facade length or the scripting of the, uh, the stability as such, as this tower is proving, or the landscaping. Uh, to imagine to start with floors of, say, office program or housing program and start to connect them in that way that at that moment you have like hollow escapes, gardens, pocket gardens that are interconnected gratuitely through this kind of um, balconies from jump from one place to the other. And that leads to then maybe towers that makes more sense, make more openings, make more love and make more care. There's a whole series of them, and I'm not going to explain how, this, um, uh, how each they do a kind of scripting. And of course, they lead to a new kind of software that ultimately any tower can be imagined as such, uh, some from scratch, uh, uh, at any place. So welcome to these towers, to this Paris city here uh, um, upstairs or beside this door. I go into the next chapter as such to say what are we looking at in a way. It, with this kind of, say, studies, or how does these studies even become more theoretical, and how can they later be applied? We all use this kind of, say, pixels at the moment. And I want to show, like, an in, in between, a short introduction on this pixel power, which in itself is also a domain of further research as such. Uh, there is this uh, famous film that you might know. Where can you sh slim it down? The Turn down the, the noise a bit. Where um, see everything on screens is somehow connected with pixels. Can you thin down a little bit? Then I do it myself. So what is uh, the uh, interesting in that moment? What this film suggests? I browse through it for a moment before I come to its say point where I need to go. Let us say here. So that we can read our society in such a way that um, everything is informationalized, has, say, this pixel value. Pixels is not more than a carrier for information of the lowest size and to bring it, say, to a larger scale as such. These pixels have been studied already for a while. I tried once to describe that in this magazine uh, with this kind of deja vu and looking to, for instance, how architects uh, the last decennia are working on somehow to work with, with this kind of matter, to think about small scale and to bring it to connect with, with the large scale. You can see it in, in Montreal, you can see it in the 60s in Japan, and recently you see a block of architects that are working on this matter. So let's face that and let's use it. And I always say that it's not bad to go on with a certain kind of research. I mean, natural scientists do it, but they all refer very well to the one that was before. I always compare it with a text research, one could say. You start with a text, and the next one um, makes with track changes a kind of comment. And, and, and by, by showing it in that way, maybe architecture can innovate itself. Yes, I can innovate Montreal. Yes, I can innovate Hermann Herzberger if um, I um, uh, accept that. There were some tools that with, where, say, this pixelization and this has carried a kind of informational research, because that's what it is about. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So in this case, for instance, when we divided the built area uh, between different say, kind of functions, the interesting thing became at that moment, if you define a house, what is the best neighbor? And it defines that through uh, describing the facades that all surround it. And then with every position, every function, that can find through that act the best position in, say, any block as such. So there are a series, of course, of circumstances that dictate that optimizational frontier research, one could say. And if you do one uh, slider better, then you get another kind of, say, composition of this kind of mixed environment. 
here. This is the most diverse environment I can make with 100 units for a minute. So here I beat already the, the generation of the 60s that were completely dredged with monofunctionality. If I add one parameter, say construction cost in it, wow, then it sinks down in this case to this level. And if I add light to it, it sorts a little bit away to say the south in that way. And if I add then another parameter in it, say noise, then I get this. Wow, not bad. I could have never designed that. Laws are simply lovely sometimes. Or they, you can accept them, and they can be optimized in this kind of, say, software as such. We can apply that here in one city where we uh, came up in the end with this solution, and then with this kind of view from the motorway, connect it with another CAD program, and then the building is done. Architecture, did it lose its meaning? No. It becomes then a tool because it has defined all this kind of mixture. It has defined that there are opening acts in it. So we didn't lose our position also, although that some people might think about it. This issue is scaleless, that I would like to say. You can apply it on houses, but you can do it also on regional levels. You can split it in the same way as I described a house on different say, uh, uh, zones and different say, scales at that moment. You can pixelize from the bottom to the top or from the top to the bottom at that moment, and then you connect it somehow that these influence each other. That's what this abstraction is showing. So here it goes into a region, looks to a map, um, uh, uh, yeah, dates up its, um, its, its program, uh, distincts itself and connects it uh, with other kind of places of the world, start to compare it, and I think that's an interesting one because then you can compete uh, with others and therefore you can become better. Uh, you rank yourself in that kind of uh, uh, comparative act, and by a series of, say, hypotheses, this program can sort out possible, say, directions, and that can change this map by different scenarios in this way. So here, in short, suddenly we can turn it into a city planning device. Opening up is also extending to that kind of uh, areas. It cultivates at the moment in a space fighter, where one could say how this globe could be seen like that, how we can zoom in in that four here into Dubai, how this real estate uh, um, figures are positioned into these pixels, and then by simply changing it, no, 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 no. Let me say, in this case, by connecting it with a comparative analysis of different cities, here you see that trade diagram coming up, this city, in this case Dubai, here another kind of value prognosis is then, uh, say, um, shown in a kind of uh, simple way and moves this value from Dubai into that. I know it's abstract for the moment, but I needed it for like five minutes in order to go further and, and, and in order to say, okay, that, that, that this makes sense. It is not only a formal issue, as I said before, but it's a way uh, to, uh, to master somehow the complexity that surrounds it. And, and that brings me to the next subject, and the next chapter. Let me see where it is. How can we then apply it on, uh, uh, on our matter? I'll give you some uh, examples of this porous city, uh, say this kind of exercises uh, are, are actually on this one. How that is then applied in design for our buildings? Can we imagine buildings that are really possible, like, like that, is that way? So uh, we did some, very briefly. Uh, this one in Madrid, where we just kicked out one block uh, so that at that moment you would have a collective, say, zone uh, where all these neighborhoods would surround itself from where you can oversee this city that is kind of contained out of enclosed blocks. It became an escape act once so. But even the pavilion in Hanover a while ago was such an opener. This opening was like, like pleading for some kind of other functions. If Hong Kong could have applied this kind of towers, with this kind of forests inside, with this kind of connections, it would be better off, I would say. And it would be, have a, like a bigger buffer uh, for cooling and for uh, uh, social activities than ever before. Or in Madrid, uh, where next to that tower, say this environment, this opening act, shifting the houses, like Lego, more or less, turns into this zone where we have a block that is like more cool, and you have views to everywhere, it's not enclosed, and you give gardens for everybody uh, to survive in the heat of, uh, of Madrid. So opening acts make sense, as I showed also in this in Amsterdam act, 
where these gardens are absorbed by this mass at that moment, and where everybody from below, beside and above, can somehow be connected visually and uh, by access to these uh, gardens. Of course, you know about Taipei and our project, where the ultimate comment on that block is now in, um, under production, under realization, by they say the stack of individualism, where everybody of you has a house, can choose it, and simply stack it on top of each other. And that leads to a porosity in between that cools down the building, that gives, say, at any place a garden and a, and a meeting point and, uh, in uh, any position. So how does it go further? As the poster said, I want to show you one example slightly more in detail, how this opening act is constructed. It is uh, nearly finished, it's in Oslo. Oslo is on a fjord. Uh, they build um, um, a white uh, uh, thing, an opera, and the next door, a new kind of quartier is emerging. So how will that look like? Initially like that. And what we said, we shift the whole program from the bay up to the station, so that somehow there we can make this new neighborhood. And, we can, and then we make all these buildings like bars also. Because they have done an address, one on the fjord and on the other side on the station. But they're slender and long. Can you do that? How, what is the implication of that if we start to do that? You have more passages, more view. So we developed a collection of, um, of slices that in somehow has been discussed uh, and chosen that are interlinked, because if I make this one, the next one has a shadow or light, and that makes th that you have to work with your neighbor, and that lead it in the end to this selection, to this uh, uh, diagram, and to this choice that's now in the construction. It has these passages now, uh, 20 of them, and everyone has these long buildings that give addresses to both, uh, both sides, uh, from, say, the, the fjord to them, and they're done by different architects. And some of them are super thin, only six meter wide uh, for houses that, uh, uh, that stretch from one side to the others. Some have terraces and are accessible by, by lifts that bring you up from the bottom to the top. And some are fatter in order to deal with the program. It becomes like an eastern island on the coast of Norway, one could say. And, it's, and it welcomes you uh, when you come on with your ship from Amsterdam into the uh, welcome here. This one we developed further. This is the National Bank of, um, of Norway, and it, uh, it had quite some employees. So it was a fat slap, therefore. How can we deal with such an amount of people that work in such a, uh, such a place? We followed the, uh, the exactly here this pixel uh, method that I explained before. So every unit is therefore described and to, to for, is for someone, is for two, three people that need to work together and that want to have somehow views connections with others, and identity. How does that come? The first act was to give simply view for view lines to the cities, from the mountains uh, to the bottom of the top, to give a passage that goes through that building, to give an address, an arcade, that brings you from uh, the sea up to the building, and to deep down to give more sun directly into that building from the south. And then cut out craters of light and cut out for smokers that become like a path from the bottom uh, to the top. And as last piece, this cutting out was done also for the public program. The dealing rooms, the boardrooms, you know all these functions that banks are somehow showing their activities and need to be more controlled these days due to the recent, say, uh, paradigms that have appeared. So it, and it created a kind of connection, an internal, say, street from the bottom to the top along everybody. And that has been glassed and turned into a, a glass element. So here, you have an interior route for every connection. In combination with an exterior route to the parkway that connects all the smoker areas and, and all the light craters from the bottom to the top. This is the facade. This is the description of all the say, uh, elements that we added to this building in order to get rid of its say, monofunctionality and to turn it into somehow um, uh, a, a more human and open building. Here you come in, here you go further, you walk over the stairs, and everyone has an address to that route, therefore, uh, up from the bottom, say here the dealings room, to the top, in that way. Not more, not less, is the route of this enterprise. Actually, I love this kind of, still these kind of drawings, because these are all the plans. And if I put them rapidly, eh, so in gray you see the public areas, and in white the outside areas, and in black the offices, 
And if I go then to the, all the, the floors of such a building, then suddenly there's no floor is the same. They, it is as if I know where I'm going to work. If I have a, comp a financial compartment at the 16th floor, it is different than the one on the third floor. And somehow you identify with that area is the hypothesis. So we connect that simply with our rivet models, and that was the easiest job to do, and turn it into a building. At that moment, you see all the floors then appearing. And it turns into a rock that's simply eaten away, that somehow has a kind of relationship between inside and outside, that wants to be strong, but also be open. I think that's the contradiction of our current financial system, and that wants to manifest itself in such a kind of apparatus on that, uh, uh, on that island in, uh, next to Oslo. So and, uh, here, what we then did, made it basically a steel rack that's hyper-flexible, that because we had to work it in such a way that it can absorb, even during building activities, maybe that change in time. Um, and, and that, I think, is now going to prolong in our next research at the Y Factory to turn that into a device that becomes even more applicable. So you see that, how that has changed over time, and how we add simply some sticks in it then uh, um, carpented with uh, bricks, uh, Norwegian bricks everywhere, and then suddenly everyone has say, an interior and an exterior. Somehow there is an identity for any uh, cubicle, uh, some in bricks and others in glass, so that they can look up uh, from any position and face even a mini pixel that we designed uh, uh, in the tiles. So uh, this is the latest situation, not open yet, how you can go into the building, maneuver between the, uh, all the people that work in it uh, from the bottom to the top. And that somehow I like this kind of diagram, to see the neighbor, to see uh, the collective and to be uh, in your cell. If that combination can be done somehow in an asymmetrical, say vivid way, then we do it better than the 60s and the 70s. And then indeed I have this kind of working positions. Again, I can see the dealers, the neighbors, and the, the other people in the other compartment in the same glance. Somehow I hope with that to activate the joy of working as maybe also a certain kind of efficiency in it. So here, uh, running through the building, how it is gradually now uh, appearing and activating its hypothesis on the coastline of Oslo. This is an example how uh, to, um, to work um, further, say, on this matter. I end with uh, the last chapter of uh, today, of this porosity, and I will show you, say, some other examples recently, uh, 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 say, worked at here in this region, especially. So what is the porous city in Asia? Where are the possibilities to do that? So there are two elements that I want to show in that case. One is a solid as such. I, I do think that towers on legs can become beautiful as such and can activate within density other kind of programs. In Nanjing at the moment, we are working on this hotel somewhere on the right part. You see this whole area on the right, which is a hotel which is normally like you have these monsters here, which is boof, like that. But in a way, when you flip it, then every room has a view to, say, God, and a view down to the plaza. So that's what this best western is about. And every uh, room has that, uh, say, um, joint venture between sky and earth, and uh, somehow now activates um, this plaza that's gradually appearing on uh, the horizon of uh, Nanjing. In Rotterdam, another kind of, say, way of dealing uh, with... Uh, our way of sheltering, of making public spaces. This is a project that is uh, currently again under discussion, uh, especially for the Dutch uh, audience among us, um, a novelty, how to position on this plot again the, an extension of the Boymans van Beuningen Museum. A museum that is somehow hermetic but beautiful with its, its patios, that has a neighbor with its own kind of language, Architecture Institute, um, which in a way should never be blended with design institutes. I think one of the most stupid things that has been done. And that has, uh, and then here on this plaza that I designed with, uh, uh, as part of OMA when I was a kid. So what can we do if we float the extension of the museum on top of it? Then basically we can put this new table over there where it essentially houses one of the plazas of this, uh, of this, uh, of this museum park. So that, in a way, it's there, and it, it is dry, because all the, the flooding is here, and it's pro it protects the paintings from that further flooding as high as possible. It has this kind of section, where basically 
air is the main composition, namely the public plaza uh, as such, and that uh, at that moment uh, we, uh, we try to work on a kind of, say, art mixer that somehow uh, in this uh, table that wants to move around as maximum as possible, condition any space uh, over time where possible, so that, because I don't know how to show Solowit, I don't know how it should best be shown more dark elements. Sometimes I want to open it up again. I want to twist it to this view or into the direction of heaven or open it up uh, below so that I can be confronted with the plaza of Rotterdam. I think that would be the most marvelous museum that I could imagine to, um, uh, to have that floating over the city so that this space turns into this, say, apparatus where this mixer shows it both on the roof as below uh, its, uh, its masterpieces on that way. The museum also becomes porous, is what I mean. The pixelization is somehow even entered in any, uh, uh, say, say, direction and composition of the, uh, of the ones that want to choreograph the museum. Another example of uh, dealing with this kind of, uh, uh, say, yeah, opening up the towers. You all know, I guess, from the press, what uh, is happening in Seoul at the moment. We, it was celebrated in the press exactly a year ago in this area a lot. And the suggestion to, uh, to connect towers and to turn it into something where you could believe the towers are shaking hands. Um, somehow uh, people loved it in the first, say, rounds of the press, the first, say, 20 hours. And then it went somehow um, uh, to Europe at that moment, and then it went uh, to the US, and there were some people that were uh, uh, noticing that this had an other kind of suggestion, which is completely not true. It is a <laughs> this is construction and not deconstruction. And later, uh, when Daniel is here and he's master uh, planner of this area, he will maybe uh, acknowledge that and, uh, uh, and position this also in that way. What is it about? Let me explain that. It's this group of towers that, and when you have such a bunch of towers, and this could be, uh, then you want to somehow to connect them. Because in order to stabilize the towers, in order to make more facade length, I will explain that later, in order to give them more networks also higher up. That's what this is about. So this is our plot, which we want to keep green. These are our fat towers that initially were proposed as such. And we said, no, 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 we want to make towers where every room, every house has a corner in that way to give more light to it. Oh, then we have to thin them as such. And, uh, uh, and at that moment, there's some stuff left. We have a block here that we can't do with it. The quality of these towers is that you can go through in it and that every view can be imagined as such. So you don't want to put that extra stuff then as a podium that destroys it everything and blocks it as such. So we started to turn everything into rooms, and, and, and that rooms help to, yeah, to negotiate with the client somehow what is a better house for that kind of, uh, and say, that kind of bridge that we were suggesting. And don't put it then on the, on the floor, but bring it, say, up at that moment. And that causes, at that moment, this connection. This causes, at that moment, say, a lover between the two uh, towers. And it, you would can go through, in between, through the shopping valley. It becomes a way to have more, uh, uh, more egress. Eh? I mean, you can escape in two ways in that way. So it becomes, therefore, safer as such. And it becomes more stable as such. With that, I can make thinner towers. And therefore, more facade length per house. So that's how it uh, then starts to look. This is the structure. We add some columns. We add some uh, bracing in it. And we used, and at that moment, uh, say this um, connector, this village higher up, to make them, uh, to stabilize them. So what do you see then? You start at the bottom, you go up, have all this like slender uh, elements, and then it widens up, turns into a lung of the building, the central plaza, and turns back again into the, uh, the sky plaza on top before it disappears in the sky. So that's what it is, the story about this, 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 these towers, that these connective elements and these gardens that are suspended from, it, uh, from outside and inside in this lung that provides the air for all this kind of community. The community that has two levels, a sky path here and a sky deck at that moment where uh, all the shops and restaurants are combined and that you can see on this plot. So here you can walk around and turn and somehow I can nuance all the, the monotony 
mean, this is the first step, I would say. I mean, I think Taipei Tower ultimately is, is one step further, but this is helping to open up the towers and to give, in that word, more kind of different kind of houses in that enterprise. So you see them, and this is a house that you normally could have invented in Los Angeles in the 60s, and that suddenly is now on, on this area, and, uh, say, suspended over the city. This, kind, this is the image that I like about that. Here, all these differences glue together in, uh, uh, in, in this kind of connector, this village higher up over the city. And then when we show the current model and, and of the coming phase, where everything is like mirrored in itself, I think it becomes more a mirage than an attack on a, on a building that uh, I would never uh, would uh, combine or do. So here you see that the images and the state of the art as it is now. What can I do further afterwards? And I look to this, say, kind of enterprises that I want to make. I want to finish with Jakarta. Because it, this morning and yesterday morning, you saw maybe these kind of things happening in the discussion. It is a, an attempt to, and I want to explain the story of, um, of, of, of Jakarta, the tower, the Peruri uh, tower that we are making. Jakarta is a, it has a beautiful combination of, say, it, what could say it's the largest village on the planet. 15 million people are living in like kampongs, small uh, entities that here and there turn into higher densities. Of course, it's impossible to drive through. It is impossible with its sewage systems, and it uh, and it needs definitely some updates on that. So, I can see how can you then say shrink that city while keeping somehow the qualities of this kind of neighborhood life is the attempt that we try to do in this in this tower. So, this is Jakarta again. Uh, this endless say, uh, sprawl. It's the opposite, I would say, of Hong Kong, and uh, uh, where uh, this kind of super village now becomes more, say, three-dimensional as such. So we go into this, uh, into this zone, this former uh, uh, money factory, it's by the Minister of Finance, and if you then, say, three-dimensionalize somehow the environment, you see this kind of blocks uh, uh, appearing, smaller entities of about, say, 200 houses, or uh, between 50 and 200 houses as such. And if we could do something, this is with a journey together, uh, working on, say, what can it be imagined if we use that matter to turn it into a three-dimensional composition? Not more, not less. So how can we then see that issue? And this kind of tower, is that then makeable? Is that then doable? Um, so this is Jakarta as such, and this is what we want to, to add, because this is kind of vacancy as such. I bring you back again to that site, and in this navel uh, uh, of the Jakarta say, universe, and all next to a station in this uh, uh, view that is uh, Jakarta, to add something on it. We make the widest pavement to start with. We make a connection with the metro. We keep existing buildings and add a mosque that was, uh, uh, it used to be there. Dig a hole where possible and then have this broken tower. Start with the shopping there, add retail uh, on that zone, like mini houses on top. We have the cinema complexes on that zone, on that area. Go on with the different neighborhoods of houses. Continue with different neighborhoods of, of offices and add, say, with this kind of hotel uh, and environment on top. Then add any kind of, say, facade that is needed for this environment and throw a jungle of trees over it that filter the air so that this becomes almost like a climatizer for itself and for the environment, but more not less. Then you have such an element in, um, in, uh, in Jakarta and somehow it blends in. I know it's high. I know it's, it wants to talk with the Petronas. It wants to talk with some of your towers um, in, in this area, but somehow it uses that kind of stuff on different kind of uh, heights. So what is then, of course, the, see the excitement as such? It is um, um, somehow that you can point at where, where you live. It, uh, you can go in, and even when I, when I look up from this uh, shopping plaza, I can see somehow where I can uh, uh, want to go to, and it's connected through this kind of exterior elements to make it from, say, a small, uh, uh, a flat park to a three-dimensional, say, jungle uh, on all this uh, on this roof. So here we go further from the housing blocks around the, the swimming pool here. One, extend further to the uh, to the conference zones. I look down at certain moments to where all these say jungles seem to be connected, and where say this pattern of jungles somehow is echoed higher up. And then maybe I, I can create 
in my manner, in our manner, a kind of verticality that is combined with that porosity. And with that example, I hope to give you like an overview of what the porous city could be. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, how exciting to see you explain in person the stories of the porous vertical cities. Questions for Professor Windemars? Yes, please. Well, your porous city concept certainly adds value and experience to the spatial concept. How do you justify uh, the loss of square footage hmm. that's sellable to your more commercially oriented clients? Hmm. It's an interesting question that you say a loss of, um, of sellable uh, uh, space with it. I'm aware that currently our zoning is, is based on a kind of protective system, which basically means that you design zoning because you think that developers only want to have much. So there is no, not yet, in maybe there is a little law like in New, New York that has that which calls the compensation uh, area. So you can keep the same density in that way, but it can become higher or that you can add elements if you allow for porosity, for instance. So I only want to add to your articles in your law one extra rule for that. Though, I mean, FAR is fine as long as it, uh, you can say maybe I can compensate it with, uh, uh, you can add the height by this kind of uh, uh, porosity act in, it, in itself. So that's what the, why the tower in Madrid could happen, because I gave this plaza higher up. Or that's why we had this block in Madrid, the other one, which is bigger than a normal block and, uh, as a total volume, could, uh, could raise. And then indeed, yes, it became more attractive because somehow you or developers are like enclosed in that box. So you, have, you want to fill in everything up to the last square centimeter uh, because of some kind of financial constraints. I'm aware about that. But somehow we have this twist is not only coming there for, from a kind of governmental point of view. I also think that from, a, from developers, that kind of creativity has to be, uh, uh, has to be made in order to, to span the gap and to come over this kind of impossibility that we see all now. Because you fill in everything, you, there's no space to maneuver, and that kills creativity. I'm completely aware about that. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please, up there. Can I speak in? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, also, did you involve the movie Total Recall? <laughs> Can you uh, no, no need? You, you understand? Yeah. No. Yeah. Have you seen the, uh, the movie Total Recall? Yes, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, did you involve that to decide the house? I mean, the. Were you the one that. <laughs> I would love to make a science fiction movie. Let me say that frankly. And I do think that some of the stage sets of, Steve, of Spielberg and others are horrible. They're completely outdated. So, <laughs> so when can architects make that stage sets? And that somehow wants to provoke um, uh, that kind of. Uh, no, so I didn't in that movie. It is a kind of advertisement to find, because I think this audience and your, uh, your city is equipped for that, to, uh, to make like uh, uh, this kind of stage sets where this imagination can be even prolonged than uh, what you can see already in Total Recall, which I still think is somehow innocent when you compare to, to maybe dreams that we should maybe make. Who's like to ask the last question? Uh, uh, follow up. Actually, yeah. I want to know, uh, Total Recall, uh, 它是一個環境,是很多雨水的。很多不同的。雨水。There's okay, a lot of rain in that yeah. environment. 那就是在一種建築裡面,排水系統和電力系統會不會變得很複雜呢? He asked about how he sees about drainage and the uh, electricity supply system, how you see it as such. Well, there's somehow a negative tone in that film, I agree with you. And that rain is everywhere there. It is... <laughs> And I would like to make, shoot the same film than in another kind of climate. Maybe then that would be, uh, be better. But um, um, so these, I'm not sure if these towers are rainmakers at that size. If we can uh, change our client, how much can we change with our client with, with our urban matter? A little bit we can do. That's what I, I try to answer in this Jakarta tower, that our towers can be so, they, in this case in Jakarta, so much needed to, uh, to have shadow and to provide cool air, I think we can do that with our buildings. And, uh, but then we have to make it thinner. And uh, then we have to make it more porous in that way. Yeah. If they would create more rain, 
No, we're not that far yet. But I, uh, uh, so, it, uh, but climate makers, yes, I do think that we should. That I that I learned from your question, and uh, that I would uh, plead for that we see our production uh, of our built mass as a somehow as a climate changer and not as only as a climate acceptor. Mm. A last question. How do you think Hong Kong city? Porosity for us. As you know, uh, the last time I was here, we, did, um, we made a film on Hong Kong. And it was a little bit hidden in this show. And the show lacks sometimes uh, a little bit of orchestration or choreography to make it more monumental, what you're actually doing. Mm. And um, so the trade fair aspect is somehow too much dominating uh, the, uh, the composition. But at that moment, uh, somewhere in the corner, we showed our Hong Kong fantasies. Uh, there was a love affair about this city. Why? Because love is there because of the, the, it's the, one of the only places where density is so high, it, where in the meantime you have the highest amount of green uh, through its mountains and its beaches, and you have one of the best transport systems uh, in the world. Yeah. That doesn't mean that everything is beautiful in Hong Kong. I mean, on other I mean, you have the smallest houses on the planet, you have the most monochrome and uh, monocultural type of houses. Mm -hmm. There is a, uh, you have dedicated to your surface more shopping than anywhere on the planet and that uh, somehow kills any taste, uh, seemingly, and that needs to, to be compensated. Um, and you have the highest, say, uh, energy consumption pro uh, person uh, due to the uh, lack of cooling uh, devices in your city. So he, see here, in a nutshell, uh, the love-hate affair that I, uh, that I hopefully share with you. That gives also a program, I think, for the city to uh, somehow Accelerate that beauty, use your density, uh, but make them, yeah, make these coolers in that city uh, uh, to make it by water, by other kind of vent, vent system. Make more access to your mountains in that way. I mean, I find it very hard to go onto your mountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of blocked by this kind of richer class that, uh, dom and that dominates basically the fringes. So somehow, uh, I could imagine that your city could be much uh, uh, more beautiful uh, based on that kind of dichotomy, that kind of paradox that I started to paint. So I really do hope that in the next BODW that you enlarge that scope even longer so that we can foresee maybe that, uh, uh, that scope more in a detailed version. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we need to see his buildings in Hong Kong soon. So thanks very much, uh, Professor Wendy Maas. Thank you very much.